This video is about cardiovascular anatomy, part three. In the last video, we ended by talking about coronary veins. Now remember that coronary veins are veins that remove oxygen from the myocardium that has been depleted of oxygen. And it returns that blood to the right atrium. One of the coronary veins that we talked about is the coronary sinus. And you can see it right here, right here. So the coronary sinus is on the back of the heart. This view of the heart is a posterior view. So we are looking at the back of the heart. You can see the apex right here. And the coronary sinus is right here. So all of the other veins or coronary veins of the heart flow into the coronary sinus, a large flat vein on the back of the heart. And the coronary sinus dumps the blood into the right atrium, uh, along with other deoxygenated blood returning to the right atrium. Um, and then the right atrium is eventually going to send this blood to the right ventricle and then out through the pulmonary trunk, trunk to the blood, uh, sorry, to the lungs. Uh, where the blood is going to pick up oxygen and release carbon dioxide. A couple other things that you'll see here are the pulmonary veins. So right here in this view, you can see the four pulmonary veins, the two right pulmonary veins, which uh, of course are returning to the heart from the lungs. Remember, pulmonary refers to lungs. And the two left pulmonary veins that are returning from the left lung. Now, when you do the heart dissection, you do have to find these, but what happens a lot of times is that they get chopped off of the heart, and all that you end up seeing is like a big hole here, big black hole. So of course, the way to tell that it, they are, this is where the pulmonary veins were, is to put a probe through that hole, and it should end up in the right, sorry, in the left atrium, of course, because that's where these blood vessels were, were turning the blood to. Now, of course, they're colored red because they are returning from the lungs where they picked up oxygen from the lungs, and, and so not, they color them red to show that they're highly oxygenated. The last thing I want to mention you can see on the posterior side of the heart is the superior and inferior vena cava. Now, remember that the superior vena cava is draining all of the blood from above the heart. So these, this is the blood coming from tissues and organs, uh, which has been basically the oxygen's been removed and carbon dioxide's been added. And the inferior vena cava is basically returning blood from tissues and organs below the heart. Both of these dump into the right atrium. And so uh, when you do the heart dissection on the sheep, what happens often is the inferior vena cava has been cut off, kind of like it is in this picture. And all that you see is an opening. So again, the way you want to test that what blood vessel this is, is if you put a probe in here and you push it around, you'll see that it's coming out in the right atrium, which is exactly where the inferior vena cava goes. Um, the superior vena cava should still be present. It has very, very thin walls, as does the inferior vena cava really thin, and they might be crushed closed. Um, again, might be um, bound tightly to the aorta or other tissue here, so it's hard to see it as a separate um, blood vessel. So you might have to look a little closely. Okay, so now that we know a little bit about the anatomy of the heart, let's take a look at some common homeostatic imbalances of the heart. And probably the most common one um, is a heart attack. Um, but often a heart attack starts with angina pectoris. So there might be some words you, you're familiar with. Pectoris, if you think back to AMP1, what muscle or muscles had the word pectoris in it or pec? Oh, you might remember it is the pectoralis major. Remember that? And there was also a pectoralis minor. But the pectoralis major are the two muscles at the top of your chest. And so angina pectoris means pain in the area of those pectoralis major muscles or pain in the thoracic area. It's usually uh, a short pe period of time um, and it's caused by a fleeting deficiency of a blood supply to the myocardium. So it's a short term 
lack of blood supply to the myocardium that weakens the cardiac muscle cells but doesn't kill them. Now, of course, a lot of people ignore this, but it is a warning sign that the blood vessels that supply the myocardium might be, supposed to be a blood vessel, might be partially blocked, maybe by um, uh, atherosclerosis. And so when people are exercising, see the blood has to squeeze through this little space here. When people are exercising, uh, blood vessels often spasm shut. And that temporary closure, because of the blockage here, um, will cause angina pectoris. So it is a warning sign. Myocardial infarction literally means death of the heart. So you can see myo, muscle, cardiac muscle, death of hearty, cardiac muscle. A myocardial infarction is another word for a heart attack. And this is due to prolonged blockage of the coronary arteries that supply the myocardium. Now we talked about the right and left coronary artery, which are the two major arteries that supply the myocardium, but actually any artery that supplies myocardium is often called a coronary artery. So any of them could be blocked, and when they are blocked for a prolonged period of time, it can cause death to the myocardium. And if that happens, you know, those cardiac muscle cells no longer work. So sometimes a heart attack will kill someone, but other times it just weakens their heart. So if you think about a heart, which of course does not look like this, <laughs> but if you, you know, destroyed the, had a little heart attack and it just destroyed that amount of um, cardiac muscle cells and you still survived, it just means that your heart is that much less efficient at pumping blood. So again, again, your heart is a pump, and if you lose this amount of your pump, then your pump is less efficient. If we take a look at this picture here, this is a heart from someone who had a myocardial infarction. This is a frontal section of the heart, and remember a frontal section divides the organ or the body into a front and a back piece. So in this picture, you can see that the myocardial infarction is down here. It's, it's within the area of the, of the white arrows. And you'll notice that most of the heart tissue is this healthy pink, but is, in this area, it is almost kind of a whitish color. And that's an indication that all of this is dead. Okay, all this cardiac muscle is dead. Now, you might not know this, but this is actually the ventricle. It is the left ventricle of someone's heart. And so you can see how large the area is where the cardiac muscle died. What do you think happened as a result? Well, if you guessed that the person died, you would be correct. This is a very, very large area of the heart, of the myocardium. Um, and especially remember the left ventricle is doing the most of the pumping of the blood out of your heart. So you couldn't survive with this. Um, in addition, here is this person's heart, so obviously they did not survive. <laughs> One other thing I want to point out here is if you look right up in this corner, you can see this funny crisscross pattern of cardiac muscle cells. And remember that this is called trabeculae carne. And I'm just mentioning it because when you do the sheep heart dissection, you have to find this. So again, this is regular myocardium. It just forms this funny pattern in the ventricles. So when you see this in the ventricles, they call it trabeculae carne. Now, talking about heart attacks, what are the typical symptoms of someone who's having a heart attack? Well, of course, the first one that comes to mind is chest pain. Um, you might think, oh, dizziness definitely an issue. Another thing is, of course, shortness of breath. And, and sometimes you will, you know, people will get a little bit of nausea too, a little bit of nauseous. So these are the, probably the most current symptoms of a myocardial infarction. So Although coronary uh, artery disease or coronary vascular disease, which results in heart attacks, is often thought as a man's disease, almost as many women as men die of heart disease in the U.S. every year. In fact, cardiovascular disease is the number one cause of death in women. 
and women are more likely to die within a year of a heart attack than men. So keep this in mind. I know we hear a lot about breast cancer, which is certainly a big problem with women, but it is far from the number one cause. The number one cause is cardiovascular disease. Women are twice as likely as men to have heart failure. So what does heart failure mean? Well, it doesn't mean people don't die immediately from heart failure. It means that you have damaged enough of the myocardium that the heart is no longer able to supply the organs with what they need. And so in other words, it's no longer able to get the blood supply to the organs that they need for oxygen and nutrients. And some of the symptoms that you see in heart failure is um, uh, people are fatigued, they're tired a lot. So they, they might walk a very short distance and get out of breath and tired. And of course, that's because the skeletal muscles aren't getting enough blood and oxygen. In addition, it's harder to get the blood back to the heart um, because it's not pumping as strongly. So the, heart, the blood will pool in the ankles and the lower extremities. And as it pulls there, the, the, the fluid that's inside the blood vessels in blood will move out into um, the tissue around the blood vessels. And that's why you'll see the swollen ankles. So that's a lot of times, um, you know, a sign of heart failure. Um, a lot of times women have heart attacks and they're not aware of that. And they call that a silent heart attack. I'm sorry about that. And um, sometimes this happens at night when they're sleeping. They might feel a little discomfort, but it doesn't wake them up or they feel it during the day and they just ignore it. So it is many of these silent heart attacks that can weaken the myocardium enough such that people have heart failure. Um, now the concern here is that coronary heart disease is on the rise in women between this age group, group 35 to 54, and of course, this is women who are in the workforce, so that's something to think about. And the big problem is women often have um, non-typical symptoms of heart attacks. So of course, we just mentioned what the typical symptoms, symptoms are. But in women, some of these non-typical pain symptoms um, are often things like pain in the neck or the jaw. or they could have back pain. Um, often it's the upper back behind the shoulder blades or pain in the abdomen, and that might be all they have. And of course, a lot of women do not, you know, they don't connect that with a heart attack and they ignore it. Um, and then there's a problem. Uh, cardiovascular disease in black women is significantly higher than in white women. Now, why do women in general have these odd symptoms here? Well, the reason is because in women, it is the smaller blood vessels, the smaller arteries in the heart that become clogged. Okay, so not the major ones like the right and left coronary artery, but the smaller ones, you know, the tinier ones down here, and that clogging of those arteries and blockage results in different pain symptoms. So you might remember, um, in a &P one you heard the term referred pain. And referred pain is where you feel pain in um, skeletal muscles or smooth muscle um, in a part of the body that does not have any damage occurring in it. Um, and this has to do with a crossing of signals in the nervous system. Okay, so um, let's continue on now. We're just gonna finish up with heart valves. It's the one part of the heart anatomy we didn't go over. And of course, there are two pairs of heart valves, two pairs, four total. And the goal of heart valves, no matter which one you're talking about, is to make sure that blood goes in one direction. We don't want it going backwards. Now, two types, one type of valve is called the atrioventricular valve. And of course, these are between the atria and the ventricles. Okay, and so these are preventing backflow into the atria. So remember, blood goes from the atria to the ventricles, and then from the ventricles, it either goes out through the pulmonary uh, trunk, if it's coming from the right ventricle, or it goes to the aorta, if it's coming from the left ventricle. So you don't want it to go backwards. 
Now the right atrioventricular valve is also called the tricuspid valve. And that's because it has three flaps of endothelium. Now remember that endothelium is just simple squamous epithelium sitting on connective tissue. And these flaps of endothelium, remember how thin um, simple squamous epithelium is. These are very um, flimsy valves. The left ventricle is also called the bicuspid valve or the mitral valve. And it's called the bicuspid valve because it has two flaps of endothelium. It's called the mitral valve because a long time ago, actually even, in, even today, um, bishops, religious people, had these hats, these two pointed hats like that, and those are called a, a mitre. Now a mitre, um, you'll notice, has two points. The eight left atrioventricular valve has two flaps, and that's why they named it the mitral valve. Seems a little silly. Um, the valves are actually um, attached to the side of the heart, but they're also uh, attached to chordae tendinae. Okay, chordae tendinae are made of collagen, and so they are very strong. Remember, collagen is a protein that conveys strength. So these chordae tendinae attach to the valves on one end and to papillary muscles on the other. Let's take a look at this here. So here again is an anterior view of the heart. And we have here, of course, a frontal section. Some people call this a coronal section. Um, here on the right side of the heart, you can see right here the tricuspid valve. So it's hard to see from here that there are three flaps. That's just because of the view. You'll notice um, that we have the chordae tendinae attached to the papillary muscles, the finger-like muscles, which are, of course, myocardium. They just form this funny shape. On the left side of the heart, you can see here the um, bicuspid valve or the mitral valve. And again, same thing, attached uh, by chordae tendinae to these papillary muscles. Okay, so how do these work? Well, if you look in this picture here, you can see the blood is returning to the heart. It's returning to the right and the left atrium, okay? And as it starts to fill up the right atrium or the left, it just pushes past the valves. So here it is again, entry coming from the, let's say the right atrium, and it just pushes its way past the valves, pushes them aside and enters um, the right ventricle, okay? So then what happens is the um, atrium is going to squeeze out the last drops of blood out of the atrium, and then the ventricle is gonna be full. Now the ventricle is going to contract any second, but milliseconds before the ventricle contracts, the two papillary muscles contract, okay? And it's showing you this here. So the two papillary muscles contract and they pull on those cords and they start to bring the flaps together. And then, boom, the ventricle contracts and the blood is gonna go up this way, right? Through the pulmonary trunk, but it's also gonna push back this way. It's gonna push back you know, on the valve. As it does, it causes the valves to push outward. See how it's causing them to they're, it's kind of causing them to bulk outward. And as they do, they come together because they're swelling and they just come together. And as they do, they block the entrance. So now, of course, you know, the blood can't go back here. It can't go back because the valves are together. So again, what's happening here is that a split second before the ventricle contracts, the papillary muscles contract first. Okay, they're gonna contract first. And as they do, they pull on the chordae tendinae, which starts to pull the valves closed. Before they completely close, the ventricle contracts and the blood slams up into these valves and causes them to balloon out like that, effectively closing you know, the entrance back to the atrium. 
Okay, so that's how it works. Um, this is another view of the bicuspid valve, and you can see this is the valve part. So the part that's in pink is the valve, and then you have the chordae tendine, right? And here you have it closed. You can see the two flaps. This is a human heart, a real one, um, although it's from a cadaver, so things are kind of dried up here, but here's a papillary muscle, here are the chordae tendine, and here's the valve. Okay, so that was kind of an interesting look. Now, what about the other two valves? They're called the semilunar valves. Well, these are between um, the, the, the uh, ventricles and the great vessels. So for example, the aortic semilunar valve is between the left ventricle and the aorta. Okay, and the pulmonary semilunar valve is between the right ventricle and the pulmonary trunk. Okay, now again, their job is to prevent backflow of blood, backflow to the ventricles. You want the blood to go out through the aorta or out through the pulmonary trunk. Um, so let's take a look at that. And again, here we have an anterior view of the heart. We have a frontal section. And um, here you can see uh, the pulmonary semilunar valve. Now just FYI, sometimes people just write pulmonary valve. I actually like pulmonary semilunar because it reminds me what they look like. They kind of look like a, a little half moon, you know, but they look there's like three half moons there. Um, so semilunar valves um, always have three flaps, just FYI, I mean, the only one that has two flaps is, is really the, um, the mitral valve here. Um, you'll also notice no chordae tendine here. And then here, it's, it's kind of hard to see because it's underneath is the aortic semilunar valve right here. Going from the aorta, it's between the aorta, sorry, the aorta and the left ventricle. Whereas the pulmonary semilunar valve is between the right ventricle and the pulmonary trunk. So, how do these work? Well, here we go. We've got the blood in the ventricles and it's going to go out through the pulmonary trunk. See, this is right ventricle to pulmonary trunk. And it doesn't matter which ventricle we're looking at here, but when the ventricles contract, they just blow by those valves. They just push them aside. And it's kind of interesting to notice that the valves are attached to the wall of the pulmonary trunk. See, that's where they're attached. There are no strings. They kind of, if this is the wall, uh, the pulmonary trunk, they just come out kind of like that. It's kind of weird. Here's the other wall. They kind of come out like that. And then there's a third one in here coming forward, but I, I'm not really good at drawing that. So anyways, the blood goes through and just pushes them aside. And then as it gets up into the pulmonary trunk, you know, it's going to keep going through the pulmonary um, arteries, but some of it's gonna backflow like this. And when it backflows, it fills these little cusps up. And as it fills them up, they bulge out into the lumen of the pulmonary trunk, effectively blocking it. Okay, so this is a little different than the atrioventricular valves. There are no chordae tendine. It's just that when the, when the blood comes back, there's a little bit of backflow, it fills the cups up, which cause them to bulge out and block the entrance. So that's how they work. And one thing I wanna mention about all these valves, I think I said that semilunar valves always have three cusps. The tricuspid valve has three, bicuspid has two. Yeah, that's generally the way it works. Um, but in anatomy, there's always variability. That means sometimes people are different. And there have been instances where people have three valves for the bicuspid, um, or one valve even, which is crazy. Um, so just FYI, and that's normal. That's normal variation. Okay, here's a real human heart, and I thought maybe you guys could see if you could guess which valve is this. We're looking on top, and I'll give you a clue. This is the superior vena cava. If you look here, this is the aorta. Okay, so what it, blood vessel is this? That will give you a, a big clue as to what 
you can see there's no, first of all, there's no chordae tendinae. Well, if you guess this is the, the pulmonary semilunar valve, you are correct. Okay, and you can, you can see how, again, it comes in like this here. They come in, there's a third one here. Um, th we're looking here into the right ventricle. Right ventricle, they've cut it away so you can see, and you can see the chordae tendinae. Um, you can also see this structure here, which you guys are gonna have to find. Oops, sorry about that. You're gonna have to find this right here, this little thing on the sheep dissection. This is called the moderator band. And uh, it's a funny little mini muscle that connects the, the septum, the interventricular septum, which is between the ventricles. Uh, it connects it to the right wall of the um, right ventricle. And they think what it does is it speeds up the rate of the action potential. It is only in the right ventricle. Here's um, one more picture. This is a view of the heart. We're looking on top. This is anterior. And they did a transverse section for you to see this. And I just wanted to show you the aortic semilunar valve. You can see the one, two, three cusps. And here's another picture of it. So you can see these are really like little bowls that you can fill up. And as they get filled up with blood, they bulge out so that there's no opening. Of course, this is showing a little crack here, but that's because this is from a a non-living heart, so you know it kind of dried up. Um, one more view. This is a sagittal section. That's remember that's when you cut a heart right down the middle, and it's good because you can see here the uh, mitral valve, or also called the left bicuspid valve. You can see the little chordae tendinae, and you can also see the myocardium. So this is the left ventricle, and look how thick the wall of the left ventricle is. Look at that. Now let's look, go over to the right ventricle, and I know it looks kind of funny here, but this is the thickness of the wall of the right ventricle. These are little projections that come out. So that is a huge difference. The left ventricle wall, myocardium, is much thicker than the right. So which, which ventricle do you think is stronger, can produce more force? Well, if you guess the left, you're correct. And it has to produce more force because remember the left ventricle is pretty much pumping the blood through the aorta into all the tissues of the body. Where the right ventricle only really has to pump it to the pulmonary trunk and then to the lungs, which is a, a shorter distance. And so remember structure determines function. If you see a thicker myocardium, it means it has more force and that's because it needs to have more force for its function. And lastly, right in the middle here is the interventricular septum. And again, if you remember what these words mean, inter means between, and septum is Latin for wall. So this means between the ventricles is a wall, <laughs> and this is it.